and we are recording. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Yasmin Farshad. I'm the Practitioner Education Manager for Wise Women Herbals, and I want to welcome you to this month's educational event through Wise Women Herbals Practitioner Learning Community. If you've attended any of our previous events before, thank you so much for uh, joining us again. And if this is your, your first time joining us, we extend an extra warm welcome to you. Today is part three of the webinar series entitled Foundational Approaches and Practice, a guide to complementary support for the five pillars of health by Rachel Alm. During her first presentation, Rachel provided an introduction to the five pillars of health and discussed why it is so important for each body system to function properly in order to create a strong foundation for wellness. She then dove into detail about the importance of nutrition in this process during part two, discussing how whole foods can influence specific organs and systems within the body. Today, Rachel will continue to build on her previous discussions of the five pillars of health, and in her presentation entitled Balancing Botan with Botanicals Using Medicinal Herbs to Strengthen the Foundations of Wellness, she will take a closer look at botanical support in a nutritional practice. She will discuss herbal actions specific to digestion, blood sugar regulation, fatty acids, mineral balance, and hydration while reviewing current research on some of these herbs. Rachel Alm is a nutritional therapy practitioner, master medical herbalist, and board certified in holistic nutrition. She is the owner of Open Road Botanicals, a lead instructor at the Nutritional Therapy Association and the Herbal Wisdom Institute. She lives in the magnificent Grand Canyon National Park with her uh, Park Ranger husband and their two amazing children. And she also manages community gardens. Uh, she produces her own line of botanical medicines and offers community-based wellness services. Rachel creates offerings uh, focused on opening channels needed to release burden, allowing the body to heal itself as nature intended. In her classroom and in practice, she combines the science of holistic health with the art of compassionate individualized support. You can follow her on Facebook as well as Instagram for all her latest adventures. This is an interactive event, so if you have any questions during Rachel's talk, please feel free to send them through the chat box and um, either her or myself will, will answer them as we go. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Rachel Alm. Wake, welcome, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you, Yasmin. Amazing welcome and so good to be here again. I'm so grateful for the chance to talk more about plants and how it intersects with this world of foundational and functional nutrition, um, just to round out this whole clinical perspective in uh, the last of this three-part series. So thank you, Yaz. Thanks to all of you for being here in attendance and present today. Um, I want to start by wishing everybody a happy lunar eclipse, full moon, and Capricorn, kind of an exciting day astrologically. And um, the message that I get from that particular um, event in the skies is an invitation to rest a little bit more. So if that rings true for you, I encourage you to find a way to really prioritize rest for yourself today and this week and really soak up the summer um, and do something that really restores you and fills you up. Um, and for me, this is part of what fills my soul is to be able to talk about plants with all of you passionate people. Um, I see my role is to help the helper who wants to use medicinal herbs in whatever wellness profession you are currently offering. Um, so I see many familiar faces, lots of new ones too. So good to have everybody here. Um, before I share my screen and start my discussion today, I am curious to hear from all of you if there is a plant that you have been using lately um, and in what way you've been using it. So is there something that um, you're using medicinally or something that you've noticed growing around you or something that you've been meaning to study more? Is there a particular plant that's been on your mind lately and how are you using it? Um, or how are you creating a relationship with it? Um, so I'll start and you guys can text or just think about it, doesn't matter. Um, but for me, calendula, I went and picked a sweet little flower from my garden today. I've been using it a lot. And the way that I use it and am in relationship with it is to grow it in my garden. And I'm going to share a lot more about this particular plant in today's talk. I'm so curious to hear if anyone else has a plant that they're loving or using right now. It's also a nice way to just connect with um, all of us 
wherever we are calling in from. So um, chat box away. Hi, Mallory. Yes to nettles in an infusion, um, rebuilding and restoring. Yeah, what a perfect application for that, Mallory. I love that. And um, so uh, United Plant Savers list. Um, let's check on Lady's Slipper. I'm not sure if it's still there, but um, still a really beautiful, wonderful plant ally. Ashwagandha for chilling out. Matthew, I love that. Wonderful suggestion. Um, any plant you've been eating, let, you know, a more in a culinary way. Um, it's summer, so fresh herbs, basil, oregano. Have you tried lemon thyme? There's so many amazing herbs available to us that um, we can actually grow outside. So um, thanks everyone for sharing some of those plants. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, we'll get started in just a moment. It's taking its time, always. All right, can I get a thumbs up? Are you guys seeing my screen, seeing the slides? Cool, thank you everybody. Um, so as Yaz has already given that introduction, I won't um, review everything that I have reviewed before, simply to say that my goal is to support you in bringing in um, some, some really concrete information that can help provide some, um, some backing, some confidence for you um, it, as the practitioner in incorporating herbs into your practice. So um, in the world of plants, there's, a, there's so many different ways of knowing and uh, creating relationship and using these plants medicinally. Part of it really is to have a strong scientific understanding, and part of it really is uh, more of an energetic or relational type of connection that you have with your plants. And um, that's where bias is actually a good thing in practice. So if, if you are drawn to specific plants, if it's ashwagandha or lady slipper or nettles, or calendula, there's a reason that that plant is of particular interest to you right now because it's um, likely meant to be part of your unique materia medica, which is your collection of plants that you have come to know well and you use in practice on a regular basis. Um, so there will be some of my favorite plants infused into this lecture today. Um, and coupled with you'll you know you'll see my passion and interest in these plants but coupled with that i, I intend to bring in some scientific research to help support the use of it um, and also get down to some of the dosage involved in using these plants medicinally and a note on that i am not a physician dosages that i recommend are not coming directly from me um, and being recommended to you but they are coming from the literature and so oftentimes there will be a range that's appropriate for um, therapeutic applications so you'll notice a range of dosages in some of my my slides here so uh, next just as a recap, this is a three-part series. The first one was in May, and I talked about the foundations of health. The next one was in June, and I talked about incorporating nutrients and foods um, to support each of those foundations. And then today, it's all about the plants. So um, I teach for the Nutritional Therapy Association. We look at the body as having five main pillars of health. And when we are working from the understanding that the human body is a series of complex systems and they're all anchored in these five foundations, we have a new way of looking at the body's ability to achieve wellness. Um, so, you know, do understand that when I'm speaking about these foundations, these are the five that I'm talking about. So digestion, blood sugar, dietary fats, minerals, and hydration. And these all account for physiological stability. Complex dysfunction is tied to instability in some or all of these foundations. And boy, are we living in a complex world. Um, as a culture, we're less grounded, we're sicker than ever, we lack solid footing. So really coming back to the uh, foundation and building a bedrock 
a bedrock that's built on intuition, a, build rock, a bedrock that's built on supporting our nervous system, and really beginning from the ground up because as we can see the consequences of our sick culture and unmet foundational stability is really manifesting in visible ways. So many uh, complex and very life adversely affecting illnesses that people are experiencing today. The good news is we have the opportunity to rebuild and I truly believe that. So um, I like to remind my students and my clients that the body's main goal on this earth is to live, to recover, to move forward and keep the train moving despite adversity. So um, just take a moment to appreciate your body for being able to roll with the punches. We get exposed to things. We might have a trauma or an injury or an acute situation, even a chronic situation. And the body's primary propensity is to live and function and keep you alive on this earth. So um, just a moment to appreciate that the body is constantly rebuilding. And we, um, as wellness professionals and keepers of our own bodies, have the opportunity to support that rebuilding process by uh, manipulating and, and uh, creating an environment around us that is supportive of that rebuilding. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we have to look at the symptoms. Um, and when we have a good picture of the symptoms, whatever clinical assessment you use, you still have to dig deeper. Ask more questions of your client. Begin to understand how those dots have connected to manifest the current issues your client is experiencing or your own self. And then we have to really do a methodical step-by-step -step approach. We start from the very beginning. We start from the basics. And all along, we're honoring the individuality of each person that we work with. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. That's why we have to do the digging deeper. We have to understand the unique variables that make up each human being and the story that we carry with us. So um, I strongly and firmly believe that plant medicine has a prominent, prominent and primary role in this rebuilding process. Um, we are given so much potent medicine in nature, and plants have always been a very good source of medicine. Many of the currently available drugs uh, that we have today in the pharmaceutical industry are derived directly or indirectly from plants. You know, some examples are aspirin coming from aspen tree, um, or valium coming from valerian. There are, it's a long, long list of plants that have um, been co-opted um, and used in pharmaceutical industry. So we recognize there's a time-honored tradition to using plants as medicine to help balance the body. Um, everyone who participates in these webinars was given a gift by Wise Women Herbals Practitioner Education, um, and it's a document that I created called Foundation, the Foundational Complement Chart. Um, and it is a compilation of a lot of different information. I'm going to stop sharing my, um, my slideshow so that you can see this other document. Nope, this one. Um, so that's what the cover looks like. The title, Foundational Support, Herbs, Nutrients, and Therapeutic Foods for Holistic Healing. A little bit about me a little bit about how to use this tool in your practice. And then as a big picture overview, there is a table and it is broken down by the foundations, beginning with digestion, moving all the way through blood sugar, fatty acids, hydration, mineral balance. And then there are um, four columns. And in the first uh, webinar that I offered, I really focused on why we support the foundations and what each of those pieces are within the foundations. Webinar number two covered these two right columns, how we can bring in therapeutic nutrients and foods to address each component of this system. 
Today, I'm talking about this particular column here. It's the herbal medicine column. And you will see that there, it's dense with information. There are a ton of plants, um, a ton of different ways that we can use each of these plants. Not every plant is going to work for every person. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do here is I gave you the big picture document. And now I'm gonna zoom in on just a few particular plants for each of those organ systems and foundations and then blow that up. So really close lens on a couple of particular plants for each of these foundations. Um, thank you, Chris, for that comment about lady slippers still at risk. I appreciate you saying that. And as always, conscientiousness for all of us plant people, we have to honor, um, what's happening on our planet in terms of over harvesting and um you know lack of hospital hospitable environment for certain plants that we know and love and really need to be very carefully uh cultivated and foraged and or purchased by someone who is doing that with reverence for the plant um so coming back to my powerpoint slide and as a reminder um All right, let me back out here. Okay, so uh, the complement chart is going to be the companion for today's conversation. And I'm gonna go through herbs that support each of these um, big picture, lots of information, then I'll zoom in and then blow that up too. So from a digestive perspective, we have to first understand what the messages of the body are telling us. If somebody is having digestive issues, we need to know how to identify those and be able to tie them back to the different components of the digestive system, bearing in mind that if someone is presenting with an issue in say the small intestine, that doesn't necessarily mean that the problem originated in the small intestine. Likely it has to do something it has something to do with the fact that there was an issue before this, the small intestine in the digestive process. So we say there's this north to south motion of digestion and it begins with the brain. So we have to really look big picture at the functions here. Um, if a client is presenting with some of these symptoms in this indication column of digestion, say reflux, or um, they can hear or feel their digestive process taking place, meaning it's gurgly, it's loud, um, maybe there's some, some bloating, some gassiness, some smell. Um, those are signals from the body that likely there's an, a need for upper GI support. So, um, you know, let's look through this list of potential symptoms and then think about from an herbal medicine perspective, what action do we need? What kind of plant has which action that will combat the particular symptom or set of symptoms that the client is experiencing? Remember, we are each unique. Every plant is unique. Not every plant is going to work for every person. So you have to really get to know the nature, the energy of the plant itself so that you are not perpetuating an issue. You're, you know, if someone tends to be um, a hot person, you want to be careful not to give too many warming plants because that could actually exacerbate some of the symptoms. So looking at cooling instead. Now, um, upper GI symptoms. If they are having some bloating or discomfort, um, they have a lack of appetite. And a lack of appetite is really a signal of diminished digestive fire, also known as Agni in Ayurvedic medicine. The action that we would need to take, and we need to find a plant that supports this, is something that will stimulate the appetite. Um, also, to stimulate the secretion of those digestive juices. Um, the plant that I've chosen to highlight that particular action is ginger. This is one that we know, we love, um, and I probably talked about it in the last webinar too when I was talking about therapeutic foods, and that's where there's really beautiful overlap between um, herbs and, and um, therapeutic foods. 
healing foods, right? They're all in the same family of plant medicines to support us. Anywhere you see an asterisk, that's where I'm going to um, talk in greater detail about that plant. So I'm gonna come back to ginger in a minute. Um, what about if we're looking in the uh, northernmost part of the digestive process and the upper gastrointestinal tract, what if it's not so much an issue of lack of digestive fire, but infection, ulceration, irritation, inflammation in the gastric mucosa? Well, in that case, we don't need to stimulate digestive juices. We don't want to bring more heat and fire. We actually need to do the opposite. Bring, uh, bringing in a soothing, demulcent, or mucilaginous plant, a vulnerary, meaning a plant that heals wounds. One of my favorites and classic application here is marshmallow or anything in the mallow family. Um, I mentioned, I think previously, that my favorite mallow of the high desert climate where I live is globe mallow. Um, really beautiful little apricot flowers, just abundant and prolific and what's amazing about this plant is that it grows in abundance in the hottest one of the most harsh and arid climates in this whole country in the desert southwest um, and then here in just right mixed in with all of these you know um, harsh pokey hot plants and in this environment that's very um, very challenging to live in there's this sweet, soft, moistening little plant called globe mallow. Um, so it's amazing to see that doctrine of signatures there where the plant will really come and step in and show itself for what it is or who it is and what, um, what it can offer in its environment. So marshmallow, globe mallow, Malva neglecta, even that weed that grows all over in your garden, that's medicinal. You can chew it up, you can make a poultice, you can make a tea. Um, do a cold infusion would be my recommendation for those mucilaginous plants. So just a powdered mallow root, put it in a jar before you go to bed, pour some room temperature filtered water over the top, come back in the morning and it will have created a nice little gooey, slimy texture in the water. Um, sweet, very pleasant, very soothing to the whole body, um, not just the gastric region. So UTIs, irritated bronchioles, um, digestive inflammation, it's lovely, head to toe, mallow. Uh, liver gallbladder, if someone is experiencing intolerance to dietary fat, meaning they eat fat, fatty foods and they feel nauseous, they get a headache, they have pain in their up, right upper quadrant, um, you see the fat in the toilet in, that's coming out with their stools, that's a sign that there's uh, insufficient biliary fun, uh, flow, function, secretion, or all of the above. So uh, thinking about plants that have the action of a cholagog or a choleretic, um, anything that ends with gog, G-O-G-U-E, means it has to do with the movement of a fluid. So a cholagog means it's going to support the movement of bile. Um, lymphagog means movement of lymph. Amenagog, lymph, uh, movement of breast milk. So uh, versus a choleretic, which has more to do with production of bile. So maybe we have enough bile, it's just not flowing and we need to help it move. Maybe our body, our liver is really just not making an adequate amount of bile, or maybe it's both. We need help building the bile and we need help moving the bile. Um, and then we also want some hepatoprotection, something that's gonna really protect the liver here. So bitters, my favorite. Uh, Oregon grape root and dandelion root, two classic bitters. There's another one, gentian root, which you'll see here in the pancreas section. I'm gonna talk about gentian in more detail. I'm gonna pause for a question that came up in the chat box. No, I'm not seeing it, sorry. Yasmin, did I have a question? No, I can't see it. Yes, so uh, Dr. Allen writes, Globe mallow, how is it prepared after harvesting? Tea of flowers or leaves? Oh, great question. So the way I use it is actually to dry it and powder it and mix it in with other gut repair nutrients like 
uh, licorice root and black pepper and even some L-glutamine um, and turmeric. So m that's my approach and that's how I use my Globe Mallow is to um, make it into a powdered formula and then mix it into a little paste. So you can use honey, applesauce, yogurt, coconut oil, and just make a little spoonful and swallow that. And it's almost like a, it just like slips right, <laughs> slips right down your throat um, and take that on an empty stomach to help soothe mucosa all the way. The alternative is to go from the other end and do a suppository or an enema if someone is having really lower GI inflammation. That's where Globe Mellow is really lovely there. Um, so powdered is my favorite for Globe Mellow, but I also, um, as mentioned, love to do a cold infusion. So after I've dried it and powdered it, I'll pour some cool water over and let it sit overnight and then drink that cold infusion that way. It would also work in an infused oil. If you wanna do it topically, you can make a salve. Be really lovely for that purpose as well. So I'm gonna come back to gentian, but just as a note, um, we think of gentian as a classic bitter, and we think of bitters as being supportive of digestive secretions, but it also um, really has strong actions beyond the digestive system. Um, you know, it, it supports pancreatic enzyme secretion, but it also helps support the pancreas in the release of those endocrine hormones of insulin and glucagon. So um, gentian root, whoa, I'm going to talk about that more in just a minute. If the small intestine is giving us messages, gassiness, bloating, upset tummy in general after eating food, we need to support motility. We need to help with cell repair. We need something that's vulnerary. If there is ulceration or inflammation or micro tears in the villi and the microvilli of the small intestine, also known as intestinal permeability, we really need to bring all the repair to that small intestine. Um, if there's an overgrowth, we need to look at herbs to combat that. And then um, general soothing and anti-inflammatory actions. Um, calendula coming up soon, my favorite for that purpose. If there's an overgrowth, garlic is a classic along with oregano oil and a whole list of things in that um, complement chart. Hey Rachel, we have one more question. Sure. Does mallow require fluid to be paired with it for mucilaginous benefits? Yes, oh that's such a good question. So um, if you chew it up, your saliva is mixing with it and that's the liquid that's creating the mucilage. Um, so it, any way you take in mallow, it's going to be mixed with some liquid, whether you're putting it in your salad and just chewing it up that way, or if you're making some kind of a powder or a cold infusion. Um, so it is the combination of the mallow plus some kind of liquid that makes the, the goo. Great question. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah. Large intestine, uh, that is going to show up as things that we um, most frequently recognize in our digestive system when something's up because um, we notice it in our bowel movements. We'll notice that something feels different, looks different, smells different. There will be some clear indication that um, something's going on in that last super important phase of digestion in the large intestine. Um, many of the same actions needed here, as would be the case for the small intestine. We need to support motility and movement. Some people have really slow transit time and things just aren't moving through. Or the opposite, things are moving through too fast and it's irritating and you're not absorbing your nutrients and you're not absorbing your water. So we need to really support the peristaltic movement of those muscles, slow it down or speed it up depending on the indication. Is there an overgrowth? Are there wounds? Um, I have vulnerary on there twice. I must have <laughs> thought that was worth mentioning. And here, turmeric. Um, I, I wanted to talk about turmeric just briefly because it's so popular. Everyone knows curcumin, right? That's the, the bioactive component of turmeric that everybody knows to be anti-inflammatory. Um, we also know that it really doesn't have a huge effect on an anti-inflammatory level just when you take turmeric um, itself, except in the digestive system. So if you are eating turmeric 
or using it in some form, if you're taking capsules or whatever, um, it will be beneficial only localized to the GI tract. It's not going to have systemic effect. If you want to boost that curcuminoid capacity and the potency of it, pair it with a fat and pair it with black pepper. Those are some of the companion nutrients or accessory components that will help facilitate greater uptake and a systemic effect of the turmeric. So lots of research on botanical medicine for the digestive system. Um, part of the Wise Woman Herbals Practitioner Education Series is Dr. Glenn Nagel, a naturopath, who's also doing these webinars. Many of you, I'm sure, have participated and benefited tremendously from the information that this doctor is sharing. And he has a document. It's a link here in my slide. Um, um, it's available on the Wise Woman Practitioner site, a whole list of studies that this doctor compiled about the benefits of bitters, not just for digestion, but beyond, um, even in terms of uh, blood sugar metabolism and cardiovascular protection and things like that. So um, rather than go on and on about the benefits of bitters, I'll direct you to his presentation where he covers it so well and just really makes a great case for why we need bitters for everything. Um, but then one in particular I wanted to make sure to highlight is uh, gentian or gentiana, um, classic bitter. So if you have ever had a cocktail with Angostura bitters, that is the bitter flavor that is being added by your um, whoever is making your cocktail. Um, and it has been used not just as a flavor for cocktails, but it has this digestive supporting effect of, of helping to stimulate secretions. And, and so often, um, culturally, you'll see a little aperitif, a small um, drink of something with a bitter flavor being served at the end of a meal, and that's meant to help support the digestive process. Um, fantastic research on gentiana. Um, and then ginger, I, I you know, promised to talk more about ginger. I think it's just truly phenomenal to recognize um, the multitude of benefits of ginger. And one in particular that I love to share, it comes again from an Ayurvedic perspective where we want to stoke our fire or our agni, A-G-N-I is the Sanskrit word for digestive fire, but it's really metabolic fire. It doesn't just, um, it's not exclusive to digestion. Our whole body needs to be able to um, burn, or so to speak, um, incinerate the foods that we eat and absorb those nutrients into the body. Um, we also need to burn off and release things that um, are no longer benefiting us um, we need to have a spark for life. We need to have, um, you know, a strong fire. And it needs to be balanced because I know many of us have felt we're a little too hot. We have a little too much fire. Um, but in terms of the digestive fire, the recommendation here is to take some fresh ginger and slice it very thinly and then pour some lime juice over the top, squeeze a lime over the top of that very thinly sliced ginger, sprinkle some Himalayan salt, and make that, you'll make a little dish of it, and that should last you for several days because you're taking one or two bites before each meal to stoke your digestive fire. It's very tasty and does a really nice job of priming the pump and telling the body that more food is coming. So when we're talking about all, I'm going to go back, um, looking back at all of these particular concerns that a client might be experiencing that are the body saying, digestive issue, help me out. I'm having undigested food in my stool. I'm having a history of reflux or gastric ulcers. Um, something is really clearly not right with my digestion. Um, so often we really have to take a look at intestinal permeability as being priority to address before the body can heal. Until the digestive mucosa is healed and sealed, we are not going to be able to reduce systemic inflammation in the body. Um, so that's really kind of getting to the heart of some of these other more complex things that clients experience. And 
if they're if we're in need of an appetite stimulant or a digestive tonic or if we need some wound healing um, if we need some antifungal actions while th there happens to be this plant that that really does offer all of those actions and it's really amazing to just review this plant and all that it can do it's not a magic bullet for everything but it has so many uses and applications i felt like it could just really hit the bullseye on so many of these actions and issues that we want to face for intestinal permeability so this is calendula officinalis it's a multi-dimensional medicine meaning it it's a jack of all trades. It can do so many different things for the body. It's often uh, referred to as herbal sunshine, which I love. Um, it's really, really perfect for intestinal permeability because it's one of its most well-known uses is to knit the skin back together after there's been a wound or an irritation. Um, so let's just review some of the primary actions of this calendula plant. It's a lymphagogue, as I mentioned, so it's going to help stimulate the movement of lymph throughout the body. And if someone is dealing with intestinal permeability, then likely they're experiencing some stagnation and they need to support the movement of that lymphatic fluid that will cleanse and bathe the tissue. It will clear out debris, um, especially if there's been some, some, some hepatic overload because of the toxicity that is coming from the gut through those tiny tears in the gut mucosa back into the bloodstream where it then has to go through that whole liver detoxification process again and again and again because the body cannot let go of the toxicity that is you know being released in bile the bile should be able to bind to fiber and be released as a healthy bowel movement but when there's intestinal permeability we don't get that opportunity to unload it continues to recirculate so you can imagine the lymphatic system is going to be overburdened and so when we can support the movement of that lymphatic fluid um, we speed up the healing process and we also really just clear out those lymph nodes that might be um, holding on to too much um, an alterative so that means just helping out with everything basically that's an action in the herbal medicine world that i love to talk about because we all need an alternative it doesn't a plant might not have just one specific action like being a lymphagogue but it has all of the nutrients and it has all of these gentle effects to support what our body already knows how to do so an alternative here supporting the body's innate ability to heal and live and thrive um, so calendula can help with that. Classic vulnerary healing wounds and what is gastric ulceration or intestinal inflammation, but, but an internal wound. Um, so we think about putting calendula gel on a rash or a mosquito bite often. Um, just think about the amazing things it can do internally for us. It's also a bitter. It also will tone the gallbladder and stimulate the movement of bile. It modulates inflammation. It can help um, production of milk for mamas who are nursing. Um, it tones the immune system. It's antimicrobial and antifungal. Uh, how do we use it? Well, a tincture is a really classic way to go. If you want to pick all of your flower heads while they're fresh and beautiful and at their highest vibration and literally bottle that stuff. You can do so by picking um, just the whole entire flowering head. So typically we don't use the stem or the leaves or the root, but the flowering head and not just the petals, but actually the whole base of the flower is really potent with medicine as well. So just below the base of the head, fill a jar, um, with these beautiful little uh, pieces of herbal sunshine and then pour a high proof alcohol over it like cane alcohol um, or uh, Everclear super high proof alcohol because of the high moisture content in fresh plants and let it sit for a month or two months 
um, come and visit it often, shake it, say hello, how you doing, and uh, just know that the alcohol is extracting all of those beneficial constituents. And um, then you can take a dropper full. Alternatively to alcohol, you could use glycerin, um, but in that case, you'd want to dry your calendula first because glycerin won't um, extract all of the fresh plant constituents that way. Infuse it in an oil, classic salve for babies with very gentle skin, any skin. Um, if you have eczema, if you are prone to itchiness or allergic reactions, uh, a very gentle calendula infused oil. Um, I love to use sweet almond oil. Some people um, would prefer to use something like sunflower oil um, or olive oil. Beautiful, beautiful ways to use this plant. Um, and you can make a tea of it and drink it, and you could dry it and powder it. Fantastic plant for so many things. And then moving on, um, the blood sugar system. So uh, we know there's something going on in the blood sugar system because blood sugar roller coaster, uh, because we can't go too long without eating or we get hangry. Um, we are out shopping at the grocery store and suddenly we have this hypoglycemic episode and we can't see very well and we get shaky and sweaty and we have to start eating food right off the shelf. We can't even wait till the checkout to buy it. Um, any symptom of HPA axis dysregulation um, related to stress response, a, a exaggerated stress response, or if you've been in that exaggerated hyperadrenic pattern for a long time, you might actually come down the other side and have no response. Even when you should be worked up, you just don't really have the vim and vigor to react to stressful events anymore. You can't get out of bed in the morning. Um, focus, you know, cognitive function is, is hugely impaired with HPA axis dysregulation. Um, if you've been told that you're pre-diabetic or you are insulin resistant, um, these are all clues from the body that we need to support the blood sugar handling system, which includes the pancreas. We have insulin and glucagon being um, secreted from the acenar cells of the pancreas. We have the adrenal glands secreting cortisol and adrenaline. And then we have the liver, which is responsible for converting a lot of the glycogen, well, stores glycogen, and then we'll convert it to glucose as needed. Also gluconeogenesis. Um, and then the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue are responsible for glucose uptake. And the adipose tissue is also um, storing some of that glycogen as well. So again, with the calendula, it actually has been proven to reverse hepatitis um, in the liver and also uh, pancreatitis in the pancreas. So high potent anti-inflammatory for internal organs as well as external irritation. Um, garlic, I'm going to come to in a minute. Licorice root is really fantastic for um, helping the body to regulate cortisol output after, say, a course of steroids where there's been a synthetic cortisol um, and the adrenals have just not been working. Um, licorice can be a fantastic way to gently um, but very effectively stimulate the adrenals to start doing that adrenaline and cortisol output again. Um, in a more appropriate rhythm. Um, if someone is already in a high cortisol output, um, licorice root might not be appropriate. In that case, um, looking more at alteratives and nervines to help the body just recover while you're addressing some of the external influential factors and stresses. Um, Gymnema sylvestre, excellent plant. I'm going to talk about that one in a minute too for helping to um, improve the function of insulin in escorting glucose into the cells so you can create energy for your body. Um, and then horsetail, I have this here with the skeletal muscle and adipose tissue because horsetail um, is so uniquely associated with the bones. Um, let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. A couple of really fantastic studies if you ever want to come back and reference these, um, and if you're like me and you get really excited by all of this research, these are some good ones. Um, so the second one is actually a review of 10 years of research, all on what plants do for the blood sugar regulation system. 
10 years of observational research about how plants have been used to help support the blood sugar system, especially for those who are diabetic. Um, so the first one is more specific to plants that have an insulin mimetic property, meaning they can do the work of insulin or help the body produce more insulin so that the insulin can more effectively lower blood glucose levels. Um, so, you know, ethnobotanical research suggests that there's more than 800 plants with anti-diabetic activity. It's truly phenomenal. And here are a couple. So garlic, uh, you know, we, we know garlic can be good for, uh, you know, providing sulfur that can help convert some of the toxins in our, you know, uh, liver detox pathways, right? The sulfur is important there. Um, we know that it's antioxidant throughout our whole body. It can help uh, tone the heart and bring down um, high blood pressure levels. But here, when we're talking about blood sugar regulation, this, re this research showed us that with 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, in any of these forms, whether it was an ethanol extract, garlic oil, or garlic juice, all of them are insulinotropic, meaning they're helping to, the, to support the body in producing and utilizing insulin. Um, the activity due to, uh, this activity is due to the increased hepatic metabolism and increased insulin re release from pancreatic beta cells. So we know that if you eat garlic, your body is going to be able to convert glucose into energy more effectively because it's supporting the functions of insulin. Fantastic, eat your garlic. Um, and then horsetail, Equisetum myriacatum. This one is really beautiful. I'll show you a picture in just a moment. But in a study of seven and 13 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, the glucose lowering effect was comparable to a really common pharmaceutical for diabetics known as gliburide. So taking your horsetail as an extract can help lower blood glucose levels. And then gymnema sylvestre, 400 milligrams per day, um, and that's an isolate, lowered fasting blood glucose and insulin requirements. And it's also, this is amazing, known to regenerate the beta cells of the pancreas. So, um, you know, there may be a little bit of hope even for type one diabetics where the beta cells are no longer functioning and secreting insulin. Gymnema, for anybody who's, having, who's had some pancreatic damage or they're recognizing the body's just not producing insulin, um, gymnema might really help repair and regenerate some of those cells. So moving on with our foundation of fatty acid, I coupled fatty acids with lymphatic support because I really believe that they go together here. Um, we need fatty acids for so many functions in the body and plants do have a couple of really important functions related to the way that we um, emulsify, absorb and transport those fatty acids that we're eating or taking as a supplement. Um, we need biliary support, bile breaks down fat, so what plants are going to support the bile? Bitters, um, enzymes, and then also the cholagogs and choloretics that I mentioned. So a couple examples of those, um, classic dandelion root, any kind of bitter that you like and love, eat your bitter greens, but also um, get a variety of bitter plants and take them in an extract form, a few drops before each meal. Rosemary has really lovely choloretic effects. And olive oil does as well, because as we know, one you know, main stimulant of biliary flow is the ingestion and consumption of dietary fats itself. So uh, why not infuse your olive oil with a little bit of rosemary and pour it over your salad with a, a mix of bitter greens, um, and then maybe uh, grate some dandelion root and mix that in with your dressing. Um, there you go, supporting the bile on a major level, a tasty level too. The lymphatic system is what is transporting those fatty acids. Um, and so we need to have lymphagogs and plants that are helping to stimulate the movement of lymph. Um, our heart moves our blood, right? We don't have a pump to move our lymph. 
the only way that it moves is when we move and help to encourage that circulation and that movement. Um, and along with that, we can take uh, botanical lymphagogues to help stimulate the movement. My favorite is red root, also known as Ceanothus, um, found in Ponderosa Forest here on the Colorado Plateau. I love to, um, to dig it up when the season is right because it is one of those plants of abundance in my region. Um, and you'll recognize you've got the right plant because you strip off the outer bark and you see this vibrant red color. That's where the name comes from. Cleavers. Um, if you live anywhere except the Southwest, you've probably found cleavers stuck to your pants as you're walking through a woodland area. And then again with the calendula, it's a lymphagog. We need to be hydrated to move our lymph, and we have to move to move our lymph. So those are all cofactors and components of the fatty acid foundation here. And then last but not least, the foundation of mineral balance and hydration. I see these as going together because we need the mineral electrolytes to facilitate hydration of the body. Um, so there's this lovely concept many of you are familiar with called the doctrine of signatures. It has to do with um, the way a plant looks, where it grows, and what characteristics it has that will help give us a clue of what it offers therapeutically. Uh, so a classic example you might all recognize is a walnut. Have you ever looked at a walnut and found that it, it looks strikingly like a human brain? And walnuts happen to be very nourishing to the brain. Um, so here are three herbs that each really uh, represent this idea of doctrine of signatures for minerals in the body. So horsetail, this one up here, it looks so similar, in my opinion, to a spine in each vertebrae and then the nerves coming off of the spine. Um, and we know that horsetail has a really high silica content. It is nourishing to the bones and to the nerves. So how cool is that? It looks just like the thing that we can use it for. Uh, burdock root over here with these red thistly like burrs. This deep red color gives us a clue that it's very rich in the mineral iron and can be used very effectively for building the blood, um, in a case of anemia, it can help with uh, erythropoiesis or the creation of more red blood cells. Um, and it's also hepatoprotective, meaning it's going to protect the liver, um, which is involved in, um, in the functions of our blood as well. And then last but not least, one of my favorites and one that Mallory mentioned this morning, she is using sting, uh, stinging nettles to rebuild and restore herself. And it's so perfect for that because of the complex of micro minerals available in stinging nettles. Um, if you look really closely, you'll see all of these little stinging hairs here that if you've ever touched a nettle, you know um, that it can really sting and burn. Um, but this is a really good plant for your hair, for your nails, for your teeth. And I see this doctrine of signatures really suggesting that here because of the high amount of calcium and other minerals that it contains. So uh, just to wrap this up, those were our foundations and some botanical applications for them. When the foundations are established, so when we recognize each of these five foundations and where there is instability. When we can support that instability with dietary interventions, botanical support, lifestyle modifications, then from there on out, the rest is really just a series of adjustments. So we need to always kind of listen in and take stock of our body once we support those foundations and, and use close observation. Use your intuition, develop that communication with your own self about when you know you need something, when it's time to adjust a protocol, a dietary um, program, um, you need extra sleep, you need to um, you know, change your living situation or your work situation or a relationship, right? So we're constantly observing, listening to intuition and developing a close relationship 
with the medicine that's available to us so that we can be um, in alignment and stable and supported. Um, so that completes my conversation about balancing with botanicals. I hope to see you all again in future offerings. Until then, um, please do go to my website. I have a, a guide there about developing deeper relationship with plants. It's called Three Ways to Up Your Herbal Game. I, I make medicine. I love to share. If you've got questions, please don't hesitate to email me, rachel at openroadbotanicals.com. If you're not a nutrition professional and you want to deepen your training on that particular powerful skill set, um, I can't recommend enough the Nutritional Therapy Association and maybe starting with their free Nutrition 101 course and then you can go from there. Um, I also highly recommend the beautiful Botanical Fundamentals Kit from Wise Woman Herbals. Um, it's your medicine chest and your test kit all in one if you plan to use herbs in practice. Uh, so that completes my talk today. I want to thank everybody and see if we have any questions with the time that's remaining. There are any questions now, feel free to um, either unmute yourself or you can also type them in the chat box. And then if you have questions that come up later, not a problem, you can uh, contact Rachel or you can get a hold of us uh, through customer service and we can find a way to direct you back to Rachel. Um, I'm typing in a discount code here for my website. If you want to make a purchase, WWH family, Wise Women Herbals family, um, and that will give you 10% off an order of $36 or more at my website. And um, thank you, Aaliyah. Um, as always, I love to talk plants, so if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I just wish you all uh, wellness and a joyful summer and a chance to rest and be still with this lunar eclipse today. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, if you haven't checked out part one and two of her webinar series, please do that. She did a phenomenal job talking about the foundations, talking about nutrients and food to help support that foundation. And then today was a fantastic way to wrap up everything and bring everything together, talking about botanicals and how botanicals will also support your nutritional protocols and the foundation. So um, you can find those talks uh, through the uh, Practitioner Learning Community website. So there are replay links that will take you to our Wise Women Herbals YouTube channel, and you can find those two there. Um, everyone who attended today will be getting the uh, thank you email with today's replay link um, in case you uh, would like to share this. Um, we will we'll have that link in there for you, and then you'll also get that foundational uh, support chart as well that she talked about today. Uh, and that will be a PDF download. So. Um, thank you again, Rachel. Um, just a quick announcement. We are, uh, Wise Women Herbals will be sponsoring a two-part online webinar entitled Botanical Approaches to Women's Health by Herbalist Chris Vaughn. And uh, you can find information on how to register for that event on the Practitioner Learning Community also. There's a, there's a link to register there. That will be Friday, August 9th at 11 a.m. So if you're interested in women's health, specifically uh, menstrual cycle, PMS, and as, uh, as well as uh, menopause, we will be talking about their Therapeutic approaches on, on how to address those conditions. So um, if there are no other questions, Rachel, thank you again so much. And hopefully we will have you back again to give another fantastic talk. And on behalf of Wise Women Herbals, thank you for joining us again. We look forward to seeing you on our webs on our next webinar. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Be well. Bye-bye.